I'm Andrew Jackson. I'm the Economic Geologist with Global Resource Investments, and I'm responsible for technical evaluations of the mineral companies and their properties that Global invests in. I put together this Ore Deposits 101 series of talks to help non-technical people understand ore deposits. The talks highlight some of the features of the main deposit types that investors in the resource sector may come across and provide an introduction, introduction to the jargon that you will find in press releases put out by exploration and mining companies. This is the seventh talk in the Ore Deposits 101 series and today we will cover volcanogenic massive sulfides or VMS deposits as they are often abbreviated to and sedimentary exhalative or SEDEX deposits. They are both products of seafloor smokers but they differ in their geological settings. Let's start where we always do in this series, showing how the VMS and SEDEX deposits fit into the overall scheme of things. You'll remember that nature concentrates the metals by a process of partially melting crustal rocks at depth, letting the melt rise through the crust and cool, dumping the valueless materials such as feldspars and amphiboles on the way, and concentrating the really useful metals in the remaining magma or hydrothermal fluid. Cool, dump the dull stuff and skim off the useful metals. VMS deposits are some of the last deposits to form in terms of the upward migration of metals and the mineralization drops out of the fluids either right at the surface of the seafloor or within a two, few tens of meters of there. So they form at even shallower depths than the shallow epithermals or carlin deposits. SEDEX deposits are not directly related to the volcanic activity and so don't fit in directly to the SURF framework. However, their mode of formation is just so similar to that of the VMS deposits that I've clumped them together for these talks. Comparing VMS and SEDEX deposits, both are submarine equivalents of the epithermal hot spring deposits that I discussed in part 5 of Ore Deposits 101, with minerals deposited from geothermally heated water at or near the rock water interface. The mineralization in both VMS and ZX deposits is deposited pretty much at the same time as the rocks that host the mineralization. This is termed syngenetic mineralization as opposed to epigenetic mineralization which is deposited long after the surrounding host rocks. The main difference between the VMS and SEDEX deposits is that VMS deposits are dominantly copper and zinc rich and are associated with volcanic activity, whereas SEDEX deposits are dominantly lead and zinc rich and rely mainly on the heat caused by the depth of burial in deep sedimentary basins to drive the hydrothermal system. Beshi deposits, named after an area in Japan where they, these are well known, are a hybrid of the two kinds, with a metal mix of VMS deposits, but hosted in sediments, like the SEDEX deposits. So let's start with the VMS deposits. This image shows some of the sulfide chimneys associated with a modern black smoker VMS deposit. If I fade out the text, you can just make out the black plume of hot water venting from one of the chimneys. You'll remember this cross-section from my earlier talks on both porphyry deposits and epithermals. In the case of VMS deposit, we're looking, uh, basically looking at a submarine high sulfidation epithermal deposit, venting from an underlying hot chamber into the sea. As I said, VMS deposits are uh, dominated by copper and zinc, but there are a number of other minor metals, uh, including lead, silver, gold, cobalt, tin, selenium, manganese, and cadmium, and a whole host of other ones that are sometimes associated with them. The deposits consist of a massive sulfide cap that formed on the seafloor and so it lies parallel to stratigraphy and an underlying feeder zone, or stringer zone as it is usually called. Uh, so a VMS is basically mushroom shaped. The stringer zone tends to be copper rather than uh, zinc rich. VMS deposits often form in clusters over a large intrusive heat source. 
If the heat chamber is long lived, you may get stacked lenses of massive sulfide, each fed from the same fault, but getting successively younger as you go up through the, through the stratigraphy. The deposits are pretty common, although, uh, as with any intel deposit type, there are only a few big enough or high enough grade to be economic. In spite of that, they really are economically significant, with 27% of Canada's copper production and almost half of its uh, historical zinc production having come from this group of uh, deposits. VMS deposits have formed throughout geological history and they're still actively forming on the seafloor today. Here's a bunch of, of some of the better known deposits you may have heard of. As you can see, they're scattered all around the world, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about the distribution later on. This is a cartoon 3D view of an active VMS black smoker developing on oceanic crust on the sea floor. Some of the metals are contributed by the underlying magma chamber, but as the hydrothermal fluid rises above the hot magma, it sucks in cool seawater. Sea this is then heated and mixing with the magmatic water rises to the vent, returning to the sea and forming large circulation cells that may be several kilometers across. <coughs> it is this seawater circulation through the host volcanics that provides the remainder of the metal inputs. Uh, leaching metals, particularly iron, but also base metals and sulfur on the volcanics. Metal concentrations in the hydrothermal fluids, volcanics and uh, cycled, recycled seawater are really low, just fractions of a percent. So how do we end up with ore that may contain 20 to 30 percent metal? The next slide zooms into the vent area on the seafloor to explain this. You can see that there is a funnel-shaped uh, neck of fractured rock below the seafloor caused by the violent boiling of the hot fluids as the pressure is re reduced. That in turn is surmounted by a series of chimneys that allow the fluid to escape into the cold sea. And the bottom of the sea below the thermocline really is very cold. It's often only a, a few degrees above freezing, uh, even in the uh, tropical areas. Surrounding this chimney is an exhalative lens of sulfidic material that forms on the, on the floor. The secret of the high grade of the uh, ore lies in rapid cooling of the hydrothermal fluid when it reaches the cold seafloor. As in porphyry deposits, the main trigger for precipitation is a drop in temperature rather than changes in EH or pH. Different metal sulfides tend to drop out of solution at different temperatures. Copper and gold first, followed by zinc, then lead, and finally iron. There's an overlap with the metal deposition, but that's the broad trend. The copper starts to drop out as the temperature drops from 400 degrees Celsius down to 300 degrees. The iron and the copper drops out before the fluids actually even reach the seafloor, precipita precipitating as a stockwork of veins in the brecciated funnel, so-called stringer zone, beneath the sulfide lens. The fluids are hot and because they are from a high sulfidation source, they are moderately acid. This acidity alters the feldspars in the host rocks to clays, some of which are washed out of the rock and others metamorphose to form sericite mica. The dissolved silica in the hot solutions is deposited as quartz along with the iron sulfide. You may hear geologists referring to this characteristic bleached quartz sericite pyrite assemblage that results as either QSP or phyllic alteration. Uh, but either way, um, it's all the same stuff and they basically uh, mean, mean exactly the same. As the hydrothermal fluids reach the cold seawater, the temperature block drops within seconds from 300 degrees down to 100 degrees and less. The lead and the zinc sulfides precipitate along with the remainder of the copper. The sulfides deposit on the sides and the tops of the vents, extending them, and then billow out into the to form black and white smokers that you see in National Geographic pictures. 
The fine cloud of uh, sulfides cools and settles on the sea floor, building up a finely banded layers of pure sulfides. Chalcopyrite closest to the vent, galena and sphalerite next, uh, pyrite deposits throughout the sequence, uh, and most distally from the vent, that is the only sulfide still available to deposit. Beyond that, the sulfur is exhausted, and iron oxide or hematite, and silica is all that's left to precipitate. The mass of sulfide is made up of a combination of those finely bedded sulfides that settle out of the black smokers and fragments of chimneys that have broken off and rolled down the slope. Here are a couple of shots of massive sulfide in outcrop. Note the typical fine rhythmic banding just below the hammer on the left hand photo. The photo in the bottom right shows a banded iron formation developed very distally to a VMS vent. And you can see it's made up almost entirely of just uh, hematite or magnetite, which is iron oxide, rather than sulfide, and white silica. The fluids that form VMS deposits usually reach the seafloor up faults. And because those faults represent zones of weakness, when the stratigraphy is subsequently subjected to deformation, the area around the faults is often particularly deformed. Combine this with the highly ductile nature uh, of massive sulfides, and we find that massive sulfide lenses themselves often exhibit, exhibit extreme deformation. Very often, the stringy cap, which started off at a high angle to the massive sulfide mushroom cap, is flattened and rotated to a much more acute angle, and the massive sulfide may end up squeezed into a cigar shaped rod. So now we know a little bit about how VMS deposits form, let's consider where they occur, how common they are, and more importantly to investor, how big they are and what metal grades can we expect. VMS deposits have been forming since the earliest of times in Earth's history, and they're still forming today on the seafloor. As you might expect, they're found all over the world and in all ages of rocks. However, there are a few periods in Earth's history when, when they seem to be particularly prevalent. The late Archean and the Tertiary seem to be in particularly prolific times. The blue, green and red symbols mark some of the more important VMS deposits worldwide. Okay, what about size and grade? There are a number of different classes of VMS, each with somewhat different characteristics, but I won't go into the details in this talk. Suffice to say that economic VMS deposits generally range in size from 4 to 25 million tons, with an average of about 5 million tons, although there are a few monsters, such as Cape Creek in Ontario, which is 150 million tons. Grades average 5% copper, 4% zinc, just under 1% lead, and perhaps 1 gram per tonne of gold. Again, there are a few outliers with far higher grades than these. Let's look now at a few examples of VMS deposits. Nephson's Bisha deposit in Eritrea is a superb example of a VMS deposit. It was discovered in January in 2003, construction began in 2008, and production in 2011. This is a view of the Bisha Gossen looking south before development began. The dark brown material in the foreground is a zinc rich Gossen, the weathered outcrop of the mineralization. Not surprisingly, the weather in the mineralization has been folded and it plunges to the south with the stringer zone smeared out parallel to the massive sulfides. The massive sulfide material varies from 1 to 70 meters thick. Uh, this is unusual as most VMS deposits are less than 20 meters in thickness. Bisha has a footprint that's about a kilometer long and 200 meters wide. In spite of the speed, steep dip to the mineralization, which results in a uh, pit with a high stripping ratio, the deposit has one big advantage. All zoned. 
So there is a leach gold zone at surface, underlain by a secondary enriched copper zone, with a primary zinc dominated primary zone below that. The advantage of this is that the expensive concentrator did not have to be built by startup, but it could, have been, could be constructed just a few years later when the primary sulfides are reached and funded, most importantly, from cash flow rather than debt. Most attractive of all in Bisha is the size, with reserves of 26 million tons uh, at 1.8% copper, 6.3% zinc, 0.9 uh, grams per tonne gold, and 41 grams per tonne silver. This is five times the average VMS size. As I've mentioned, VMS deposits occur in clusters, and Bisha is no exception, with a large, at least seven other VMS deposits discovered within 20 kilometers although Bisha is the only one in production so far. The second example we're going to talk about today is kind of unusual. It's actually a group of deposits that have only recently been formed. In fact, they're so young, they're still on the ocean floor and will have to be mined remotely from floating platforms. They were discovered by Nautilus, a TSX and AIM listed company, using a combination of bathymetrics and EM geophysics. The data gives a fascinating insight to the nature of these black smoker fields. This image is taken from Nautilus's 43101 report, and it shows an amazing isometric view of the chimneys of the Solwara 1 target off the coast of Papua New Guinea, derived from uh, bathymetry. The image covers about 800 meters from left to right, and the individual chimneys are clearly visible. The small image shows a remote operating vehicle's claws removing a sample of the smoker chimney for assay. For environmental reasons, only extinct smokers were targeted. Once the hot water stops flowing, the cold and lack of nutrients cause the once abundant sea life to move away or to die. Extinct smokers are therefore devoid of uh, significant sea, sea life and environmentally uh, not an issue. In a cross-section of the Solwara 1 VMS, based on mapping and, uh, in, and drilling of the deposits, we can see the massive sulfides in red. The alteration is associated with stringer zones in pale green. Although the resource is relatively small, <clears throat> just two and a half million tons, the grades are exceptionally high, with a copper grade of almost 8% and a gold grade of over 6 grams per ton. As is typical, there have been at least other 18 other deposits discovered in this particular cluster. The Solwara 1 VMS is at a depth of 1600 meters below sea level. Submarine VMS deposits have never been mined before, but the equipment that the Nautilus plans to use has a proven record, excavating trenches for submarine cables and mining marine diamonds off the South African coast. Its practicality is well established. This is another piece of uh, mining equipment that Nautilus is considering having custom built. You'll notice the proposed completion date in this old material. To my knowledge, this construction is still on hold, which gives an indication that funding and mining will not be straightforward. Once the material has been remotely mined, it's planned to pump it to the surface as a slurry, and then to begin then to transfer to barges for transport to a law a shore-based concentrator. The project is a fine example of out-of-the-box thinking but it still remains to be seen just how economic the process will be. Okay, now we move on to the second group of submarine syngenetic sulfide deposits, the sedimentary exhalative or SEDEX deposits. These are very similar in genesis to the VMS deposits except that they are not primarily driven by intrusions below, 
but are instead products of dewatering and metamorphism of thick piles of accumulated sediments in ocean basins, hence the said part of the name. The exhalative portion of the name refers to the geological process of venting hydrothermal solutions into a submarine environment. Here's a list of some well-known uh, examples of sedex deposits that you may have heard of, including Sullivan in British Columbia and Broken Hill in Australia. I'll talk about Sullivan in a little more detail in a few minutes' time. But what are the similarities and differences between sedex deposits and VMS deposits? Let's start with the similarities. Both are syngenetic, that is, they're deposited at the same time as the enclosing rocks. Again, the majority of the metal in sedex deposits is in the form of bedded exhalative massive sulfides with an underlying feeder zone. They too often occur in clusters. In both deposit types, the metals are carried in solution as chloride complexes rather than thio complexes. So the main trigger for precipitation, as I mentioned earlier, is a drop in temperature. Lastly, the massive sulfide lenses are often highly deformed. But now the differences. Firstly, sedex deposits generally form in fault-bounded sedimentary basins on continental crust, rather than in volcanic piles on oceanic crust. <coughs> for sedex de deposits, the basin needs to accumulate several kilometers or tens of kilometers of oxygen-deprived sediments, usually shales. Secondly, the heat drives the hydrothermal system is dominantly from depth of burial rather than a felsic intrusion, although there may be a deep mafic intrusion. For the same reason, the metals are not derived from felsic magnums, so copper is largely missing. Instead, the metals are de purely derived from leaching of the sediments themselves, and lead, zinc, and silver dominate instead. To form sedex deposits, you require the deep sedimentary basins, so distribution is more limited than that of, say, VMS deposits. However, they are still found on all continents, and there are around 125 sedex deposits of note, and these are marked in red on the map. They vary considerably in both size and grade. This graph shows that range in tons and percent metal. Size along the x-axis varies from 1 million tons up to a huge 400 million tons, with the mean sitting around about 20 million tons. Lead and zinc grades, that's uh, the y-axis, range from 3% up to 30%, with a mean of about 10 to 12%. <clears throat> so you can see that sedex deposits are generally both much bigger than VMS deposits and have better grades, making them highly desirable exploration targets. The problem, of course, is that they are much less common. In spite of the scarcity, they are a source of a large proportion of the world's lead and zinc. Sedex deposits range in age from the mid Proterozoic, that's uh, 1,800 million years ago, to the Phanerozoic, 150 million years ago. The Sullivan deposit in southeast British Columbia is 150 million tons, making it a larger than average Sedex deposit, but the grades are pretty much average, with about 11% combined lead and zinc. This is a cross-section through the Sullivan deposit. It displays most of the typical characteristics of sediment deposits, sedex deposits. You can see the massive bedded lead and zinc sulfides in red. The deposit is underlain by a mafic sill that may be partially responsible for driving the hydrothermal system. Shales, the shales contain highest amount of boron of any rock type, and this is leached out along with the lead and zinc by dewatering fluids. It is then deposited just below the vent as a stockwork of tourmaline-rich veins. Although the, the faults are mapped as uh, occurring to the west of the, of the vent, I suspect that the uh, vent itself is actually developed along the main structure. 
although it is no longer recognizable as a fault due to the brecciation. The rock in the immediate footwall of the mass of sulphide and above the vent is follically altered, i.e. quartz, cerocyte, pyrite alteration. The important thing to realize is that depositing massive sulphides is a slow process. There needs to be a break in sedimentation to allow the sulphides to accumulate undiluted by depositing sediment. Recognizing those time breaks in sedimentation can help with exploration for both sedex deposits and VMS deposits. And now I want to talk a little bit about expiration for both of them because techniques and strategy are similar for both. Expiration for these is like looking for the filling in a sandwich. Once you identify the break between the slices of bread, that's the uh, time break, you know that the filling will be somewhere along that plane. And that allows you to focus your efforts on just a tiny portion of the stratigraphic pa package. The stratigraphic sequence around VMS deposits tends to follow a standard pattern. It generally starts with a thick series of oceanic basalt flows. Then, during a break in the basaltica volcanism, a small felsic dome is extruded, derived from the very intruding felsic magma chamber at depth. As this cools, the hydrothermal uh, fluids vent, altering the footwall and depositing the massive sulfides horizon. The sequence is then cut off by the renewal of basaltic flows which bury and preserve the sulfides. Why is it important? Because it can help your exploration in identifying that time break that we are looking for. And the likely vent areas are near, going to be near felsic domes. This time break in, in the basalt eruption may host additional VMS deposits elsewhere in the district. Also, the faults that produced one deposit are often, le uh, often leak fluids over a long time, and stack lenses may exist on the same fault or on other time breaks in sedimentation. Although the stratigraphic indicators are not as strong uh, in the case of the CEDEX deposits, the same principle applies. Once you find the mineralization, there are likely to be more occurrences elsewhere on the same time break in the stratigraphy or up or down stratigraphy on the same fault system. So in exploration for these deposits, we're trying to see through the younger deformation and we're trying to identify the early faults, faults which may have been active at the time of mineralization. Soil and rock geochemistry and electromagnetic, ge electromagnetic geophysics, or EM, are the two most useful tool, exploration tools for massive sulfides, although magnetics and gravity may also be of value in detecting mineralization. Once you're in the proximity of mineralization, identification of QSP footwall alteration may help guide you through to the sul massive sulfide plum that you're looking for. As in exploration for all types of deposits, the drill bit is the ultimate judge of value. I'm going to walk you through now a typical exploration program for one of these deposits. I've chosen Tarsus's MOR uh, property in southern Yukon, not because it was a great success, in, in fact the project uh, has been put on the back burner now, but because it is a simple and straightforward story. And Tars Tarsus has also published a nice set of plans on their website. So on their MOR property, Exploration for VMS mineralization began with a series of soil tra uh, sample traverses across most of the property, with the lines oriented at right angles to strike, with a, no a nominal 100 meter line spacing, and a sample interval of 50 meters. That's the black dot, those are the black dots on the plan. These sample po points were guided and located using GPS. The sampling identified a large zinc soil anomaly and a coincidence slightly smaller lead anomaly. The entire property was also flown with VTEM, which stands for 
uh, ver versatile time domain electromagnetics, uh, which transmits an electromagnetic pulse from a large coil suspended beneath the low-flying helicopter, and then it records the return signal after it's been modified by passing through the Earth below. EM is capable of detecting buried conductors, such as massive sulfides. On the MOR property, the survey identified three such conductors, one of which was con coincident with both the, the soil lead and zinc anomalies. This then became the top priority target. And six holes were sighted to test that central conductor. This is a section through two of those holes, and you can see that it inter they intersected three mineralized massive sulfide horizons at depth. Uh, none of these came to surface, uh, so this was entirely um, followed from the, ge the geochemistry and the ge particularly the geophysics. In this particular case, the widths of the, those massive sulfides were sub-economic, but it shows that the exploration process was effective. That's about all the time I have for uh, this talk on volcanogenic massive sulfides and sedimentary exhalative deposits. But as usual, I'll end off with the main points that you need to walk away with from this talk. Both types of deposits are products of submarine hot springs. VMS deposits are volcanic hosted, dominantly copper and zinc and they're fairly common. Sedex, hosted, uh, Sedex deposits are sediment hosted. They're dominantly zinc and lead. And they're bigger but less common than the VMS deposits. In VMS deposits the metals are usually spatially zoned with copper near the vent and then zinc and lead more distal to that. These deposit types are major global sources of base metals, particularly zinc. Geophysics has a vital role to play in exploration, particularly EM and gravity. Finally, the next generation of this group of deposits may be from uh, seafloor mining, and the deposits are relatively small but they're uh, also relatively easy to find as they're covered only by water and they can also be very high grade. That's the end of this talk. The next one in the Ore Deposits 101 series will be on one of the most controversial topics in the geological world, the Vitvatasrand Gold Deposits of South Africa, uh, perhaps the greatest source of gold on Earth.